Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to this first of seven Towards Stockholm Plus 50 Legacy Webinars, Strengthening Environmental Governance. The event has been organized by Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future in collaboration with Forum Norway, the Civil Society Unit at the United Nations Environment Program in Nairobi, and with the support of the Government of Sweden, the host country of Stockholm Plus 50. I'm Charles Newhan, Chairman of Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future, and your host today from New York. I am joined by our presenters, Leida Reinhout, who joins us from Antwerp in Belgium, Jan Gustav Strandenes, who joins us from Oslo, Norway, and Stephen Steck, who joins us from Bethesda, Maryland in the United States. Leida and Jan Gustav are senior advisors to Stakeholder Forum. Those of you unfamiliar with Stakeholder Forum, it is an international not-for-profit NGO that has, for more than 25 years, been working to advance sustainable development at all levels. Stakeholder Forum seeks to provide a bridge between those who have a stake in sustainable development and the international forums where decisions are made in their name. Before we start, there's a bit of housekeeping to attend to. The webinar is being recorded and a link to that recording and a copy of the presentation will be posted on the Stakeholder Forum website uh, soon afterwards. Well, pardon me, actually it will be posted on the Towards uh, Stockholm Plus 50 uh, website, and that's the link that you will receive. Now a bit about uh, how the audience will interact with us today. As you will see, all attendee cameras and microphones are muted and will remain that way throughout the webinar. There will be three sessions, uh, each followed by a 10 minute question and answer period, and then a discussion uh, on forward looking recommendations at the end. If we do not need all of the time for questions, we'll move on to the following session. Questions should be submitted in the Q&A window, not in the chat window, and I'll remind attendees of that as we go through. You are welcome uh, to scroll through the questions and upvote questions, and that is vote for a question that you too would like to see addressed. That will help us to select the questions that the speakers can answer in the time that we have available. As to the chat box, you're welcome to communicate with each other in the chat box, put in information that you think might be relevant, links and so on, and we'll share the content from the chat uh, with uh, attendees uh, as a link afterwards. And I'll finally say apologies in advance for not being able to answer all of the questions due to some time constraints. Now let's begin by introducing today's presenters. Uh, Leiter Reinhout has been a key advisor to Stakeholder Forum for many years. And before joining the SF family, she worked as an independent consultant. In her position as executive director of ANPED and the director of global policies and sustainability at the European Environmental Bureau, Lida facilitated and coordinated the global NGO community to realize their active engagement in United Nations processes and sustainable, on sustainable development and the environment. From May 2022, Lida will be the chief executive of the World Fair Trade Organization, or WFTO. Stephen Steck is a lawyer and a professor at the Central European University. He is the lead researcher of the Environment and Democracy Working Group of the CEU, Democracy Institute, as well as a lecturer in environmental sciences and policy. Professor Steck's research includes the development of an environmental governance assessment framework for the European Commission and developing a methodology for governance of the water, food, energy ecosystems nexus under the United Nations Water Courses Convention. Uh, he is, was on the managing board of the Environment and Security Initiative and helped to negotiate the Aarhus Convention and several other uh, multilateral environmental agreements. And he co-authored the Aarhus Convention and Implementation Guide and wrote the UNEP Guide to the Bali Guidelines, putting Rio Prin Principle 10 into action. Jan Gustav Strandenes began working with the UN on environment and governance in the 1970s. He has been acting lecturer, lect actively lecturing about the UN for 20 years, worked for the NGOs and the United Nations in New York during the Commission on Sustainable Development years, and has carried out multiple assignments for UNEP. Early in his career, Jan Gustav worked as a diplomat for Norway's foreign office in Botswana and Uganda, and later uh, he directed a large aid and environmental NGO in Norway for two decades. Uh, please welcome Lida, Stephen, and Jan Gustav. And I apologize for the noise in the background. Uh, someone is cutting on the lawn. My apologies there. 
Uh, now, Jan Gustav will deliver the first session, and Jan Gustav, I will uh, hand the floor over to you, uh, and I will advance uh, to the next slide. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Charles, for your kind introduction. And uh, as we usually say when we're on Zoom, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. As Charles said, I'm addressing you from Oslo, Norway, and uh, this is where I live, and I have had been very fortunate to have the world as my working area. Um, one of my to one of my merits is perhaps uh, the fact that I was uh, in the the fact that I was an intern with the Morris Strong team uh, in 1972 in Stockholm. So I have a very good and vivid memories of that. So my presentation will be giving you a fair background to, to Stockholm in 1972 and also uh, to what we can and hopefully expect in June this year. Next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we will see, uh, the question is, uh, where are we now on environmental governance? Next, please. Uh, there, are, there are many issues to be covered in, in, uh, in, in, a, in a little while. So, the uh, let's start with the history and uh, see the uh, the resolution that actually made uh, Stockholm a phenomenon back in 1972, and and of course it's well reading these resolutions because they still have relevance for today. But just let me quote here. Uh, it is to provide a framework for comprehensive consideration within the United Nations of the problems of the human environment in order to focus the attention of governments and public opinion on the importance and urgency of this question. So this was the basis uh, for the Stockholm Conference in 1972. And it was also explicitly stated that NGOs the non-governmental organizations were to be consulted. Next, please. <clears throat> the um, the uh, conference began uh, in Stockholm and it was quite well attended. Uh, it was called the UN Conference on the Human Environment. And here we we'll see a picture from the plenary, next. Um, the, um, the will, we'll, next please, we will see also the, uh, uh, the, um, the result of this, uh, this plenary discussions in what came out of it. But this is an interesting picture, uh, the, the former one where, where we say that uh, the uh, headquarters of UNEP uh, was, was allocated to Kenya. You see the Nairobi picture to the right here, and the, the dark circular tower there is the Kenyatta Center, which housed UNEP's first offices. The, um, the uh, importance of this was that it was the first important UN family uh, headquarters outside of, of uh, Europe and North America and the Global South. Next, please. The next picture will show you uh, the one of the two prime ministers that came to Stockholm. Um, We'll see a picture of Indira Gandhi uh, when the next slide comes. She came to Stockholm as one of two heads of state. The other one was, of course, Olaf Palme, the prime minister of Sweden. And at the bottom here, we, saw the, we see the secretary general of the meeting, Maurice Strong. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> Maurice Strong came to play a very important role also because he became the first director of the UN Environment Programme in uh, in, in um, when he was situated in Kenya, and he left there in 1975 to be followed by the Egyptian Mustafa Tolba, who had played a very, very key role in negotiating the outcomes in Stockholm. Next, please. Uh, the, the, as I said a number of times, the, the, um, the outcome result is worth reading because even if it's 50 years old, they're still relevant. Um, we had a declaration with 26 principles. We got a 109 paragraph strong action plan. There were five resolutions. An estimated 10 to 12,000 people uh, participated. 113 countries were represented uh, out of the 132 member states in, in the UN at the time. As interesting, the discrepancy was that the Soviet Union and the Eastern European countries blocked the, the, the conference. 260 registered uh, NGOs and there were three forums, the official one, and I can have the next place, uh, slide please, and two civil society forum, one spontaneously uh, organized and one organized in a more formalistic way. 
The, the declaration is interesting, and I've just highlighted a few of the principles. One and two focuses on intergenerational obligations. Three, five, and six talk about the social responsibility of environmental issues. Some people say that this sort of uh, tells you about sustainable development. I'm not sure I would like to agree with that, but, but there is a social consequence to environmental issues. Uh, principle 11 talks about national environmental policies and uh, they should advance and not adversely affect the present or future developmental po potential of developing countries. And we see here the first so-called green conditionality. Uh, principle 10 and 12 talks about the additionality to support development countries, which we called back in 1972. And principle 21 is interesting because it is the first real formal mentioning of transboundary responsibilities, which today is, of course, a given. We can have the next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> In, in addition to the, the 26 principles, you had an action plan, six broad issues, human settlements. And uh, in a few years, we saw the establishment of human settlements in human habitat, which comes out of this. Natural resource management, very important. It was a novelty at the time. Pollution of international significance, education and social aspects of the environment. We had development and environment and international organization, the need for an architectural structure. Uh, then there were five resolutions, one called an abandon of nuclear weapons and, and, and uh, testing, international data bank on environmental data, the need to address actions linked to development and environment, uh, international organizational changes necessary to promote environment, and the creation of an environmental fund, I can have the next, which still is an important element of UNEP finances. Uh, <clears throat> so um, we... we you can also summarize what we could call the legacy of the 1972 conference in five areas. The environment was firmly placed on the global agenda, finally. If we saw the beginning of environmental governance, it was the first time that civil society and stakeholders were allowed to address on a regular daily basis the official plenary. We saw environmental law given an institutional home. We saw science and environment get a home and an environmental assessment began. And we saw environmental diplomacy beginning. And the person in the middle is the late Prime Minister Olaf Palm of Sweden, who played such a key role in the conference. Next, please. So why did we get the Stockholm Conference in 1972? Next, please. It's important to understand that the UN always works in the context of world politics. And as we will see um, in the next slide comes up, one thing that really affected a lot of the discussions and outcome was the war which was being waged in Vietnam at the time. We can have the next slide. The US forces used an, an, a, a very potent cocktail of, of chemicals in the Vietnam to, to destroy the foliage of the, of the uh, jungle. This picture is in, from Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, where the river Cuyahoga burns. And it's the 13th fire since 90, 1868. It destroyed a lot of environment and infrastructure. Next, please. The, 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 Years leading up to Stockholm saw a number of dramatic uh, environmental catastrophes, and these two illustrate two of them. To the left, you have the picture of the Torrey Canyon, a huge super tanker who went aground outside of the UK in Cornwall and, and polluted for, for, for weeks on end the maritimes of, of the channel. And the, the dramatic picture to the, to the right illustrates the Minamata disease uh, lots of people in the Minamata, Minamata Bay area in Japan had been exposed to mercury poisoning and their, their offspring was maimed. Thousands of people had died. The first uh, discharge of mercury in the Minamata Bay was in the early 1930s. Next, please. So uh, we, will, we can summarize all of the disasters in this way, and you can come back and look at this later when we will post this. At the top, we have a summary of environmental disasters or problems. Uh, for instance, beginning in 1952, more than 4,000 people died in London in two days in December because of the smog. And we go on just to list this. The middle section is how the, the non-governmental organizations and think tank responds to these 
these challenges at the bottom, you have a, a an overview of development of, of environmental law and other protocols to help safeguard the environment. All of them are reactive. Next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> Legacy area, which is important from the Stockholm Conference and which we still deal with is environmental law. We can have the next slide, please. Uh, we see that the, the environmental law system predates Stockholm 1972, but this starts it. And, and uh, it's quite clear that, that the world has an impetus to do something with the Stockholm Conference. I've just listed a few of the immediate uh, reactions to it in other contexts, not in UNEP itself, because in 1972 we didn't have UNEP. We had a marine pollution prevention prevention uh, 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 protocol. We had the Maropol uh, uh, protocol or convention coming out of 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 uh, Yonklos for the Maritimes. We had the World Heritage Convention of 1972, inspired by environmental issues. We had CITES coming into to force in 1975 an important convention on the international trade and environment. And we had the Ramsar Convention on the wetlands uh, coming into force in 1975. These are just a few of the ones that the Stockholm Conference on Environmental Legal Issues inspired to. The next, please. Uh, and we'll see also the importance of, of how these, these uh, laws inspired each other. When we see the next slide, um, we see how over the years, a number of, of dramatic decisions are taken through protocols. 1982, the UN World Charter for Nature. 1992, the Rio Declaration and Agenda 21. In the year 2000, we got the Malma Ministerial Declaration focusing on the importance of UNEP and environmental policies. The outcome document from the World Sustain Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002, the future we want, which is the outcome document from Rio plus 20, the transforming our world, the 2030 agenda. All of these sort of follow one on the other, beginning with Stockholm. Next, please. Uh, environmental laws really sets the environmental issues into a normative context, which is also important. Uh, <clears throat> and the growing understanding for environmental law uh, is if you look at the history of 50, 50 years, you see how it really comes together more and more. Um, the, the declaration serve as a basic normative framework for subsequent global environmental gatherings. Declarations and documents represent major milestones. By building on each other, they expand the understanding and concepts that attain a wider significance. For instance, the UN CBD of 1992, whose principles of conservation are informed by the intrinsic value of every form of life. Interestingly enough, the Stockholm Declaration in 1972 tried to include an um, unambiguous reference to environmental human right. It was rejected then. Now we have it. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> the second legacy area is science and the environment. Next slide, please. Science and environment was put together in an interesting way in Stockholm because it became the basis for policy. Uh, the Swedish government used five years to prepare for the Stockholm Conference, and a very key element of that preparation was asking countries to do their first environmental assessment. And 80 such assessments were presented in Stockholm. Next, please. And they were all based on very uh, scrupulously performed scientific analysis. And the UNGA resolution, the General Assembly resolution 2398 calling for the Stockholm Conference was or said a key purpose is to cultivate and mobilize even greater scientific knowledge to expose and understand the impact of modern society on humans and their environmental and foster public awareness. Next, please. So you see science, and policy with environmental law makes a very important thing. There was a, uh, an immediate response also to the fact that in the 1970s, Europe was pummeled by acid rain, which really made uh, environmental problems grow almost exponentially. So there was a need to do something. Next, please. <clears throat> we see also the beginning uh, uh, of scientific documentation. And this has been one of the fortes of UNEP. These are just a few examples of what we could call flagship reports that UNEP puts together on a continual basis, easily accessible, very low cost, but they contain environmental assessment based on 
on, on, uh, on cutting edge science. Uh, next slide, please. The third uh, legacy area that we will talk about here is the environment governance. And, uh, and uh, this is extremely important. Next, please. It sort of begins uh, with the Stockholm Conference in 1972, because it's the first conference where, as I said earlier, the civil society and stakeholder groups are allowed to address address uh, 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 an official plenary. And it changed the nature of all subsequent UN conferences and and many intergovernmental co conferences. And it also led to the creation of the nine major groups, which become a differentiation of what the so-called non-governmental organizational community was. And it also uh, made for the number of partnerships in environmental work that we have seen later. Uh, next, please. Environmental governance is something that is the focal area also of UNEP. And uh, uh, one of the key issue is to engage uh, the public at large. Uh, <clears throat> even before the 1972 conference in Stockholm, UNEP, the UN itself had started to see how they could engage people more. And uh, the so-called Center for Economic and Social Information, SESI, which is now defunct, had begun involving the public. I know Stephen will refer more to the need to engage public, uh, the public in environmental issues. Next, please. Um, <clears throat> Um, summing up, the legacy is important, and I think we can find a few key elements. We find the prevention of environmental harm, the right to development in an environmental context, precautionary action, procedural safeguards, public participation, the interface of trade and environment, indigenous people's rights, women in development, environmental liability and, and compensation. Next slide. These are all things that come out of the Stockholm Conference has been accentuated and developed further to today. And a number of successes can be listed as uh, from coming from the initiative of UNEP. The Montreal P Protocol to Safeguard the Ozone, establishing with the World Meteorological Organization, uh, the IPCC, a result of, of UNEP's work. UNEP also um, developed the chemical conventions and of course initiated the Brunton Commission. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> what are the outcomes in Stockholm? Well, we hope that some of this will come up again that I have referred to next, please. But there is now the two resolutions taken uh, for the conference in the 2nd and 3rd of June. Next, please. These two uh, resolutions are well worth reading because they will tell you a number of things about the possible content and outcome. But they've also decided that there is an intergenerational responsibility to the discussion. There will be implementing opportunities and we need to be interconnected and inclusive. And the picture here is Indira Gandhi, the Prime Minister of India, greeting Maurice Strong in the Stockholm Conference. Next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> we will also see uh, hopefully a lot of outcome discussions in and around Stockholm, but the focus here will be the leadership dialogues and <clears throat> the outcome will be um, sort of comprehensive in the fact that there will be a summary of statements. But please be, bear in mind that if you go to the official websites, both from the Stockholm 50, which is uh, organized by the Swedish government or UNIPS, Stockholm 50 or our own uh, towards Stockholm 50, you'll see that a number of activities is now growing. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> what do we need in addition? That is sort of a, an aspirational uh, request from us. Next, please. And this will be my concluding slide. Uh, <clears throat> we'll see maybe a need for uh, a strong declaration that can guide us forward the next 50 years. Continue developing environmental rights and human rights for the environment. Upgrade UNIP to a specialized agency, perhaps. Upgrade UNIP's efforts to contribute to a green and just transition. Strengthen UNIP's research and science base. Strengthen further develop environmental governance and environmental diplomacy. And strengthen the position and participation of civil society and major groups. And give the environment the status it deserves and not mainstream it into sustainable development because well, then we run the risk of may the environment being a waste stream. Focus needs to be on the environment and for the future. And I think this was my last slide. If I have the last one, I will corroborate that. And yes, this was the last slide. Thank you very much for your attention so far. Uh, thank you, Jan Gustav, so much uh, for that very informative uh, presentation. We do have uh, 10 minutes, up to 10 minutes for uh, questions. 
Um, Stephen and Lida, perhaps you want to activate your cameras and microphones in the event uh, you want to add something to uh, the questions. At the moment, we have one question in the Q&A box. Um, I'll take a quick, and I would, I would encourage our guests to please uh, think about some questions uh, and put them in the Q&A box and we'll be happy for our team to answer them. Uh, the question is, dear presenters, as the GGWI Goodwill Ambassador, I ask if it's possible through this forthcoming Stockholm Plus 50, uh, if CSOs can uh, come up jointly to pass a declaration stating that all CSOs globally should come with alternate environment reports, which make national governments and stakeholders coming on a round table with CSOs to account to um, their beneficiaries and also share the evaluated two reports, both from national governments and key stakeholders and that of CSOs and send those reports to uh, various intergovernmental bodies, uh, UNEP, uh, IUCN, GEF, et cetera. Thus uh, to all key, key environment funders so as to the average person can get involved and understand his or her contribution to have a safe and healthy uh, planet. Now, I would say to the to the get to our panels, if you want to take a look at the Q and A, you could see that it's a long question. Uh, think about it for a moment, and in the meantime, a couple other questions have come in. But would anyone like to take a stab at that first one? Well, it's it's a it's a huge question, and and it also comes up with a few suggestions. We are also going to have a global uh, online conference in in the, in two weeks' time, which will be announced where these issues can be discussed. I just want to also. Uh, point to the fact that uh, uh, we have been involved with UNEP in six regional conferences. Two are uh, uh, a, a final one is coming up in in a, in a few days, where regional input has been uh, along these lines that were were discussed. But coming up with a common <clears throat> statement may be difficult because there will be a number of conferences dealing different kinds of elements. Uh, of, of environmental issues. Climate is people will be there, youth will be there. Uh, there will be a, a conference on chemicals. There will be a conference on, on sustainable consumption and production. So all this together will probably challenge the effort to have one concise uh, uh, um, declaration, but it is needed perhaps. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jan Gustav. Uh, would Lida or Stephen want to make any comment to that before we go on to the next question? If not, um, thank you. Uh, we have uh, one one item in the Q and A is a statement, uh, uh, and we do have another question. Do we need to update the twenty two principles of Stockholm nineteen seventy two? Are are they still valid? Um, well, some are outdated because they responded to the politics of the night or the contextual politics on the world of 1972, uh, or I should say the previous 10 years. But the gist of it is still relevant. And uh, I think if you go into the principles of environment and sustainable development, you will see that they have been upgraded a number of times. Rio 27 principles uh, is a kind of an upgrade of what we see, what we saw back in Stockholm. And of course, a lot of these principles that we find in Stockholm has been in, embedded in environmental law as well. Um, is there, a, there is always a need to, uh, to upgrade issues, but uh, uh, UNEP's mandate has been upgraded uh, from the 1972 mandate to uh, the mandate discussion they had in 1997. And it was further, you could say, corroborated in the outcome document from Rio uh, plus, plus 20 back in 2012. Is there a need to upgrade the environmental principles? Yes, I think there is on a continual basis to emphasize the necessity for safeguarding the, the environment. Um, based on history, um, perhaps, but we need to understand that 50 years have passed and this is a new world with new challenges. So uh, some are relevant, others are outdated and we need new ones to safeguard the future. Thank you, young Gustav. Before we go on to another question, I see that there are some of our guests have raised their hands. Just to let the audience know, we're not going to be taking uh, verbal uh, questions or interventions at this time uh, from the audience. We might have the ability to do that towards the end when we have the discussion. We can invite people in 
uh, both uh, audio and video uh, for quick interaction. But for now, if you have a specific question, please put it in the Q and A box. And we have another. We still have another, uh, you know, four or five. You know, actually, yeah. almost uh, eight minutes to answer some questions. So we'll stick with that. But in the meantime, do please put your questions in the Q and A, not in the chat. Um, yeah, but yeah. if I may, uh, Charles, to, because yeah. there, I think there is an interesting question that was in the in the chat, but even though, um, because it's, it's it's a question about the uh, the implementation. So there is uh, already a lot of international agreements. Uh, and uh, the person in question, which is uh, Nienke, doesn't see the implementation on the national levels. Of course, we come back to that. And we also see that this is a um, weak point of, of the multilateralism, that we have a lot of international agreements, great ones with uh, great targets and whatever, but that the, the weak point is indeed the enforcement and the implementation. And that's why uh, it is so important that we have this webinar, because we try to uh, find solutions uh, for that. Thank you, Lida. Um, there's another question. Uh, how do you see Stockholm plus 50 feeding into the upcoming upcoming CBD COP15 and the next climate uh, convention? Um, I think this is a question which has been raised also by the organizers and by UNEP. Uh, as a historian, I will say there is a definite continuity in all these conferences if you go back to beginning with 1972. But it's important to take every action, uh, every occasion to, to emphasize the necessity to safeguard the environment. And I think if you, if you come up with a, a reasonably statement and if people or organizations uh, support that, it could be a way to put impetus on the climate issues. I know the, the Climate Action International are going to be doing that using this occasion. Uh, I haven't seen the same kind of interest uh, among organizations dealing with biodiversity, but you, as you know, there is a, a, an ongoing discussion on upgrading the Archie targets that should have been implemented by 2020, but they're still in abeyance in, in that respect. But use every occasion to push for the environment, I think is important. Thank yeah. you. If I can add on this, um, I think the Stockmet 50, I think it was, it was, already explained is not a negotiating uh, summit. So that is a an, an summit, it's a conference, it's a celebration, it's a commemoration. And of course there will be kind of outcomes documents, but there are no, no one, it's not one of them will be legally binding or whatever of even let's say, member states can just ignore it. I mean, to, to put it very bold. I think for that, it is also very important to look at the UNEP at 50 outcome document, which is an, uh, a more uh, negotiated, it is an only negotiated text. And that is something that you can hold UNEP accountable for. You can read it and say, okay, this, this, this paragraph, it's really important that you start implementing it. And that's also about strengthening environmental law and, and governance. So I think it's it's very important also to, to have that and have in mind that the Stockholm at 50 uh, summit is indeed interesting and important, but it is not a negotiating summit. So the outcomes are kind of voluntary. Thank you, Leida. Um, just one comment again to our audience. I see another raised hand just to repeat. We're not going to be inviting uh, guests in at this point, but we hope to do so towards the end if there is time. Uh, we have a number of good questions. Uh, another one uh, in terms of, you know, I guess we need to think about this in the context of governance and law. Uh, how can the environment benefit from global trade? Does anyone want to take that one on? Well, I would I say think <laughs> you go ahead, Lena. This is your okay. area. That's going to be my area. Um, no, I, th I, th I think uh, the environment will not, let's say, um, be helped with, with, with global trade, maybe the other way around. Um, is, is, but I mean, the more trade you do, um, and the more a lot of, we have a lot of, let's say, useless trade. I mean, all kinds of things that we don't need is going out all around the world. A lot of food is also going all around the world, and that gives a lot of trade, but it's absolutely not helping the environment. So I think one of the things that we should uh, look at is to have also more sustainable trade, more locally produced, regionally produced, regionally traded, regionally, um, 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 yeah, regionally traded and, and, and both. So I think that's something we really root should rethink our, our whole trading system, not only on the social level, but also on the environmental level, which I think is, is necessary. But I don't think that the environment will help global trade or the other way around. I think there is, of course, a link, but it's not, uh, I mean, um, they're not going to enforce uh, 
each other. But I, I see Stephen nodding as well. So maybe he wants to say something on this as well. Well, I mean, I can, yeah, I guess I haven't said anything yet. So hello, everyone. Um, yeah, it just reminded me the question, of course, there was a great um, emphasis or, or momentum behind uh, the notion that free trade would be the engine of lifting all the boats, you know, at once uh, from mm -hmm. uh, poverty to prosperity, and that that would be the solution to a lot of environmental problems as well, based on the fact that normally when, when, when you have more prosperity, you can also spend some of your uh, income and your attention on, on improving the environment, not just uh, uh, using up resources. And that was an argument that was very common around the time of the 2002 Johannesburg conference. And lo and behold, uh, six years later, there was the, the global financial crisis in 2008, which was caused uh, in large part by a lot of market failures. So I fully agree with, um, with what Lida has said about the fact that uh, you know, trade can sometimes be beneficial, but it depends on what you're trading in. And there are many things that uh, are involved in global trade, which, are, um, uh, which have negative effects. And plus, you have, in many cases, hidden subsidies there, which uh, support uh, the more environmentally harmful uh, activities. And those things are, are in, in large part, or not in large part, but in, there are uh, programs like the United Nations Environment Program, uh, which are aimed at the elimination of these environmentally harmful subsidies. So it's a very complex issue with lots of different uh, aspects to it. We can't say one way or another uh, that is positive or negative. There are certainly some ways that uh, global trade can benefit the environment, but it's not something unfettered global trade, let's say, is not going to be good for the environment. Thank you, Stephen. Let's move on to, we have time for one more question. Uh, and. Uh, so I'm afraid we can't answer all the questions that are there. We could come back to them later if there's time. So the final question after this session is how can, from uh, one of our guests, how can I slash we youth who are not uh, from any organization or association support uh, and join the Stockholm Plus 50 International Meeting in Sweden? Uh, who wants to take that one on? Can well, we the, the uh, yes. Well, first of all, do you, in order to be part of the official conference, you need to be accredited through an accredited organization. And, and the accreditation system is now closed for new organizations and the formality will close uh, on the 22nd. However, I know the youth is, is planning a huge, uh, like a, a, a huge open meeting for almost anyone who are interested. And the youth, uh, the, the youth groups are very inclusive. So I would think, <clears throat> as I am not qualified to be part of the youth group anymore, but I was back in 1972, it was very inclusive then. And I think that inclusivity will e exist today because I think then youth needs to be heard and they, they are opening their position to that. So look for the youth um, uh, information on the official uh, websites for there. I also saw another question quickly. I just want to remark if if there's any comment on the on the ongoing wars in the world. Well, the 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 similarity between 1972 and and 2022 is is somehow uh, eerie. There was the Vietnam War back in, 20, in 1972. We protested very strongly against that. We wanted to see the environmental and human consequences, and we dug up information to expose the war crimes at the time. We can do the same, and we can condemn all wars for what they're doing to humanity and to every living species. And it clearly wars break every every regulation there is to preserve life on this this planet and i think these these things can be repeated uh, we don't need a, an official mandate to do so thank you, thank you. It's, it's time for us to move on but i'll just make one comment and apologies if you said this while i was uh, scrolling through the questions and missed it uh, any individual can be part of a delegation of an accredited uh, body other accredited with the unep or uh, ECOSOC, the Environment, uh, the uh, Economic and Social Council, the UN. Each organization is only, however, uh, permitted to have three in-person participants. Uh, so if, uh, for instance, one of the other accredited youth organizations has room on their delegation, uh, you can certainly reach out to them and see if they'd be willing to uh, put you as part of their delegation. That process, I think, is open until the end of, uh, April, is that right? 28th of April or something like that. 
um, in terms of uh, nominating uh, delegates. With that, we need to move on. Uh, uh, Stephen is our next speaker. Young Gustav and Wida, if you folks could please drop out, as I will, and I'm going to uh, activate our shared screen, and I'm going to uh, give the floor to Stephen. Well, thank you very much, Charles. I appreciate it. And it's great to have this opportunity to talk to, uh, to you all today. I see we have almost 100 participants, and that's, that's great. It's fantastic. Um, first, I want to apologize for uh, the pictures I'm not going to show, because uh, my presentation is really a little bit more about um, some of the concepts in environmental governance and law. And um, it's not going to be as interesting or exciting, perhaps, as the other two speakers, at least in terms of the visuals but I hope that at least uh, will generate some discussion uh, uh, today here. So um, first of all, what we're gonna be looking at here is really about uh, what has already been alluded to. In fact, even some of the questions were aimed at this, and that is primarily the national level. So we're looking at the relationship between the state and the citizen. Uh, we are now historically in a crisis period. We're in a crisis of nations. So uh, 50 years after Stockholm, uh, we are, as Jan Gustav said, kind of back where we started in the sense that, um, that the environment is held hostage to conflicts around the world. So nations are in fact the, the problem, but they are also the solution in, their, in the multilateral world that we live in. Intergovernmental processes, and Stockholm is one example of that, are the way that we cooperate and we try to reach these solutions. So nations are both the problem and the solution. So first of all, what are the elements of good environmental governance? These uh, five dimensions come from a European Union uh, project to identify a framework for um, measuring the performance of countries on the national level. Uh, in the field of environmental governance. This assessment framework has, looks at environmental governance as having these five dimensions here, transparency, participation, access to justice being an aspect of the rule of law, compliance, assurance, and accountability, and effectiveness and efficiency. Now, uh, next slide. The, the, the first three of these are based upon Rio Principle 10, and to make a connection to the original Stockholm conference in 1972, Rio Principle 10 has been called a way to, uh, to realize Stockholm Principle 1. Now, Stockholm Principle 1 is still internationally the um, highest uh, global expression of what you might call a right to a healthy environment. It talks about the fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life in an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity and well-being. But it also is not just about rights, it's also about duties, because mankind or humankind bears a solemn responsibility to protect and improve the environment for present and future generations. That is Stockholm Principle 1. Well, how do we do that? And the answer is real Principle 10, one of the answers. Coming from 20 years later, 1992, the Rio Declaration. And um, these uh, pillars, the three pillars of Rio Principle 10, are access to information, public participation, and access to justice, corresponding to the first three of those um, dimensions of environmental governance that I mentioned earlier. So let's look at these one by one. So within transparency, you can look at a number of themes. Uh, it's quite interesting that today, if we talk about when the Aarhus Convention was negotiated back in the 1990s, um, requests for information were extremely important. That was actually how uh, most people got their environmental information about things that affected them directly. They would ask authorities who held the environmental information to provide the information to them in an information request. Today, there is so much information available around the world a lot of it is actually collected by authorities and it is made publicly available in a structured way. So that's why, um, I think go to the next, sorry, next slide, yeah. So that is why uh, environmental information systems are extremely important. 
And uh, citizen science is now becoming integrated with environmental information systems. Some examples of citizen science, I think all of you all are quite aware of that, you're carrying around in your phone uh, with, you, with you every day, uh, a citizen science machine. Um, for example, uh, um, mobility, where people are moving, which is very important to what air pollution you might be exposed to. That's just a very simple uh, example, but there are many, many others. Also, uh, people use their mobile phones to protect species that are endangered. So this kind of um, uh, information is now widely available, but on the other hand, you also have a problem which is, as we all are aware of, the problem of fake information. So this last issue here, reliability and quality of information is also extremely important. And one of the main elements to make sure that information is reliable and is of good quality is to have systems of independent expertise and review. Uh, so, and actually this requires independent uh, science as well as uh, uh, journalists and others as well. Next slide, please. So in the, in the area of participation, the second uh, pillar of Rio Principle 10, uh, these are some of the themes which are part of this uh, assessment framework. So the standards in public participation, how to conduct public participation, what rights uh, citizens have to be able to get, gather information related to, uh, to um, decision-making to, that is underway and to, to be able to to impart information, to give opinions, to raise objections, and for those things to be properly taken into account, for them to be publicly uh, made available, uh, and for there also to be opportunities to challenge those final decisions. Environmental impact assessment and strategic environmental assessment are very important mechanisms for this. On the international level, environmental impact assessment is now considered to be uh, a customary norm of international law. When a country uh, embarks upon a large public works project that may cause damage across a border uh, under the Pulp Mills decision from several years ago, uh, there's an obligation for that country to consult across the border and also to uh, take measures to minimize uh, the, the potential environmental damage. That's now part of international law. Um, public confidence in public service, that's something which is often overlooked, but if we are looking at variations in environmental performance from country to country, a lot of that depends upon the extent to which the public trusts its authorities, trusts its government to do the right thing, to follow the right procedures, uh, to be able to rely upon them to properly implement the law. And finally, equitability and inclusiveness here, and that in many countries around the world, uh, part of that uh, discussion of being inclusive and equitable is also to include uh, indigenous peoples, um, marginalized groups within society, the poor, um, sometimes minorities. These are important issues, women, uh, elderly, disabled. These are important issues to deal with in, in participation. So we can move to the next slide. And then in access to justice, some of the themes that are important here. Uh, the first thing is for people to understand that a decision uh, in a particular case may not be the end of it all. There may be actual opportunities to appeal decisions or to, um, to not just appeal the decision, but sometimes to challenge it in other venues. Uh, the standards for access to justice, how that is done, how a person um, can represent their interests and rights uh, before um, judicial or other uh, bodies. The powers, the powers of the um, of these judicial bodies, or the ones that are are providing access to justice, the, their powers to actually um, make a remedy happen, to order a particular kind of a remedy, to solve the problem. So, for example, in some countries, it's impossible for a um, for a court to order someone to do or refrain from doing something. That's called an injunction. In some places, injunction powers are quite common. In other places, they're very rare. And judicial capacities are extremely important because it's very often the case that environmental issues are very complex. They involve sometimes uh, uncertainty and sometimes they involve um, different kinds of opinions by, by scientists that are in, in sometimes not entirely consistent. 
And it's a very difficult thing in many cases uh, around the world for judicial systems to be able to, to manage that. It's an important uh, capacity building effort that UNEP and others are leading around the world. And finally, there's the issue of corruption, which is certainly uh, a problem in some countries um, in probably almost everywhere in the world, there is corruption to a certain level, certain degree. And that's a very important thing to, be, to, to ensure that when access, justice, access to justice is used, it, it results in, in a, it, it reaches a proper result. Next slide, please. In the area of compliance assurance and accountability themes, uh, compliance consists of three types of activity, compliance promotion, monitoring, and enforcement. So this often very much involves the private sector. Uh, so promoting compliance by private sector bodies with environmental rules, monitoring whether those things in fact happen, and if they if compliance is not uh, taking place, how do you enforce the law to to move towards compliance? These are all important elements of compliance. Complaint handling: How are citizen complaints um, handled by public authorities? How is it uh, ensured that uh, people will actually make complaints because they understand that their complaints are going to be handled properly? Uh, and that's something that encourages people actually to, um, to help to enforce uh, environmental law. And finally, liability systems to be able to redress and to address um, the, the damages and the wrongs that occur when the law is violated. Next slide. And the fifth theme is effectiveness and efficiency. The fifth dimension, excuse me, is eff effectiveness and efficiency. Some of the themes within uh, this include those related to financing and administrative capacity, these are resource-based issues. So um, uh, infrastructure, investments, and resources are extremely important when you're talking about effectiveness and efficiency. I just wanna mention one uh, international instrument that is unfortunately not often, you know, it's not given the attention it's, it deserves. That's the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction. And the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction is one of the main instruments for the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. And under the Sendai framework, there are lots of very direct and important um, recommendations, goals, objectives, which are established to increase resiliency of societies, uh, which relate very much to these issues uh, that are here, are here identified as effectiveness and efficiency. Okay, next. So um, I mentioned governance, this governance framework, and we're talking about governance and law. So I just want to bring attention to how the law, how law and governance uh, interact. So these are some of the environmental law issues that relate to those dimensions. And I've put in parentheses, after the legal issues, uh, those dimensions to which uh, it relates. So T is for transparency, P for participation, A access to justice, C is for compliance, uh, and E is for efficiency, effectiveness and efficiency. So legal procedures uh, are important. If you, we talked about that just a minute ago, that um, you need to have legal procedures to be able to implement uh, information and participation rules backed up by the access to justice procedures. Also in compliance, compliance is obviously uh, involves lots of legal procedures. Reporting requirements, these are, are feeding into transparency because when, um, when reporting is working, you gather an awful lot of information, which is then accessible. So transparency, especially, and also you can tell whether um, actors are in compliance. Legal standards, obviously are important for compliance. You, you have to be able to have a clear standard in order to comply with it. And those are related to efficiency as well. Remedies, legal remedies in terms of access to justice. Contracts, contracts, uh, you can have contracts uh, even in compliance um, mechanisms. You know, you can, uh, it, rather than going into court to comply or to enforce a particular law, you can uh, enter into agreements with industries or with sectors or with specific facilities uh, to, to bring them into compliance. International agreements, of course, um, in all of these areas. Uh, participation is one area where you can find quite a lot of international agreements like the ESPO Convention on Transboundary EIA and, um, and compliance 
as well. Transboundary EIA and SDA, I, I just have mentioned. Management of shared natural resources. Th these are the subject of um, international treaties quite often. And international assistance mechanisms relate to building capacity very often in the area of access to justice that can be capacity of judges and lawyers. Also in compliance, there are international networks of, of enforcement authorities as well, and efficiency uh, as uh, is there often, let's say professional networks, you might say, of people who are working in uh, the environmental field. Okay. So um, how do we strengthen environmental governance and law? And the first thing here I'm going to say is also what I'm going to end with, I believe, in a moment. We, first is to increase corporate accountability. Uh, this is very relevant to the compliance and the effectiveness, uh, but also in the area of corruption. It's an important area because uh, corporations uh, control a lot of resources. They make a lot of decisions with huge impacts on the environment. So increasing corporate accountability is a key thing. It's also of great importance to have a multi-level governance culture. And we can talk about the subsidiarity principle, which says that environmental decisions should be made at the level closest to those who are affected. Uh, and that, that means that implies multi-level governance. But uh, in some countries, uh, there is um, too much centralization. There is uh, a great deal of, um, of power co concentrated in, in, in just a few places. There are entrenched elites, but having a multi-level governance culture can make a gigantic difference. Um, Anti-corruption initiatives I've mentioned already and value-added economies. Uh, economies which tend to be resource dependent uh, often tend to be environmentally destructive. So value-added economies where you have diversification, where you have um, higher levels of skills which are applied, where it's not simply uh, extracting natural resources and selling them on the market, uh, which also has increases in, uh, instability and leads to conflict. Those are issues which um, can be addressed by diversifying economies. And keeping performance under constant peer review. This is uh, something which um, has been a highlight of some of the discussions in UNIA 5, 5.2 in particular. And I think what one of the commenters said, or uh, the questions previously to Jan Gustav about um, alternative or NGO-based performance reviews uh, is also very important here because it's, it's one thing to establish an international process where countries are looking at each other and they're self-reporting and they are reviewing each other's performance, which is key and important. And it's a huge development that is now, now happening, but it's all, another thing for there to be also independent and critical voices uh, doing the same or sometimes in parallel. So I, I would certainly highly support that. Um, and just to put things in the context of what others have been concerned about, poor environmental governance is the first thing to be obscured or to be sacrificed in the case of conflict. It's very interesting to me looking at, because you know, since I've worked a lot in Central and Eastern Europe, to see how spin is being put on the history of the region to justify, in some cases, the conflict. Um, a lot of people are looking at, uh, in, with nostalgia, at the former Soviet Union. But I think we have to keep in mind that the actual collapse of the Soviet Union was, was in large part due to the fact that it could not deliver safety and security to its people because of its poor record of environmental performance. The Chernobyl incident being you know, the prime example which, which destroyed people's confidence in the system. So if, if, if there's a conflict now between two, um, between two systems, then the side you should be on ought to be governed by how that system is going to perform when it comes to the environment uh, in the future. And that's the side you should be on, in my opinion. So um, there's also a, a generational change here that's going on. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see what comes out of Stockholm plus 50. I wanted to mention a Guardian op-ed which was from April 7th, 2014. So you can look that one up. And um, it argued for military containment 
and uh, economic uh, containment of a Russian uh, of a Russia that was um, cursed by its dependence on fossil fuel exports. And it also observed that Russia was leveraging uh, its devaluing assets into territorial gains. That was in, uh, in the case of the 2014 invasion. So uh, that seems to be re history repeating itself right now. So um, the next slide, and I'm almost done. Uh, what is UNEP's role in all of this? So uh, UNEP has done many things in the area of environmental governance and law from the Montevideo program, which supports uh, countries to, to develop their environmental law on the national level, setting international standards, for example, through multilateral environmental agreements and, uh, and uh, developing the means of implementation. The science policy interface is extremely important in terms of transparency and also good, um, uh, good uh, decision making as well, based on 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 knowledge and science. Increasing the voices in processes, for example, by protecting environmental defenders. This is a new initiative of UNEP, relatively new, and this environmental performance review mechanism, uh, which I I mentioned a moment ago. Next. And what about the Stockholm Plus 50 outcome document? Well, I would say one thing here, and that is, um, you know, sometimes you're, you're asked to give three ideas, but I really want to stick to one. And that is because after 50 years from the first Stockholm conference, still we don't have uh, clear um, binding norms for corporate accountability on the global level. and. Uh, in the, we came close a couple of times in the past. In Johannesburg, there was a pretty large initiative for that. In, uh, in, in Rio Plus 20 in 2012, there was an initiative to have uh, reporting standards that would be binding, uh, internationally binding. Um, I think it's time, and this is, this is something that Stockholm Plus 50 could possibly be a watershed event for. I think it's time for there to be a global consensus that we need binding norms for corporate accountability throughout the world, not just limited to, to minor issues like reporting standards, but all the way across the board in many, many different areas. That would be something that I would love to see come out of Stockholm Plus 50, even though I don't think that, as uh, Lida said, that that's going to be on the agenda. But um, is it a missed opportunity? Is Stockholm Plus 50 going to be a missed opportunity because there's not going to be a uh, you know, this kind of negotiated outcome, maybe not, because I think it's not entirely predictable how these things will turn out. Uh, so um, I, I'm still being optimistic. And I think it's very, it's, there's a potential for this to take on a life of its own and to, uh, to burst out of the restrictions that the international community has put uh, on the agenda. I think that there's a chance that the agenda will, as I said, uh, take on a life of its own. I think that was my last slide. So I'm very happy to, for your attention. Thank you very much. And happy to participate in the Q&A. And you. sorry for not having any pictures. No, you, uh, well, you'd made up, you made up for it with content. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who have put questions in for Professor Steck into uh, the Q&A box, we'll start taking a look at them now. Uh, I'll remind, uh, I see our, my colleagues, uh, you know, Gustav and Lida have come back. Uh, so let's start with uh, the quick look. If, you, if anyone has seen something you want to jump on, uh, go right ahead. But in the meantime, I'm just scrolling through them now. Um, let's see. Here we go. Um, one that came in um, to a member of the Stockholm Plus 50 Youth Working Group. Um, Let's see, what is the question? Uh, although youth are some of the greatest stakeholders in the state of the environment, as it is passed from generation to generation, we are often excluded from decision-making processes, especially in terms of the participation dimensions of environmental governance. How can we ensure that youth, as well as other marginalized stakeholders, including indigenous peoples, will be more comprehensively and equitably consulted in environmental governance decisions in the context of uh, Stockholm Plus 50 outcomes. Now, uh, young Gustav and Lida have a lot of experience working with the youth groups. In particular, there is a youth uh, group 
as part of UNEP. Uh, so I'll leave the two of you to start with that, perhaps, unless Professor Steck, you want to jump in first. I, I could add something after them. I, I would have something to say, but maybe after. Thank you. I just quick, quickly, um, the Swedish government has prioritized uh, the youth group to a very high extent, and uh, and uh, inside the sort of the official compound where the where the Stockholm Fifty Conference is going to be held. There are three designated rooms, uh, uh, and you might, of course, discuss the priorities given here when we talk about the nine major groups involving uh, both trade union, local authorities, women, um, and, and farmers and NGOs. So there are three designated groups that have rooms to be this, the, where they can discuss issues as the indigenous peoples, uh, the private sector, and youth. So there will be a focus on youth and, and how the youth will be be um, uh, looking at the environment, not only of today or, or yesterday, but also for the future. So they are giving uh, perhaps a more, uh, a, a stronger position in this conference or this, this celebratory or commemorative conference than, than any other ones before. Um, but, um, you know, um, we, we have to also remember that, uh, that youth, the, the concept of youth may be misused uh, by by the elder generation, and I feel I'm part of that by saying that well we can leave it leave it to the youth to solve these issues, which is not going to happen. We need to do this together. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I would like to comment on this as well because I think uh, I I don't think it's only a problem for youth here that we are not part of the decision making. It's also for the NGOs, it's also for uh, women's groups, it's also for indigenous people. So I would not exclusively say that youth is in kind of uh, not listened to. I think there is more and more the idea that participation is only a kind of consultation afterwards. When all the decisions are made, you, you get to see the, uh, the results and then you can say yes, no, or uh, whatever, because the decision making is already done. I think that is one of the things uh, that we are dealing with. There is a shrinking space for uh, civil society in general, including youth, um, where a lot of private sector, a lot of the private sector is taking over, and not the the, the small SMEs. It's the, the bigger businesses that are taking over, and they are part of the decision making often. So I think that's one of the things that um, that will come back in my uh, in my presentation. By the way, that I think that CSOs, um, stakeholders, or whoever you want to, uh, however you want to call them, should really focus on so that we have that space that our voice is not only heard after. The decision-making, but during the whole process of the decision-making, and that's exactly the definition of good governance. Um, so I think that is very important. And I, I, I also think that a lot of, of, of CSOs are focusing too much on topics, climate change, um, uh, biodiversity, uh, whatever, but not too much on good governance issues. And only with good governance, we can reach the targets and the goals that we uh, are um, asking for on the uh, national and the international levels. But I will come back to that. And I think that will be one of the discussions uh, as well afterwards. Thank you. Stephen, do you want to add something to that? Only I just wanted to say that just recently we have um, been working on a project uh, called the UNEP We Want, which was led by two uh, major groups, children and youth being one of them, the other science and technology. And the reason that these two major groups were given the lead is because if we're looking in this long term future uh, uh, perspective, children and youth are obviously extremely important and science and technology as the basis for the science policy interface and good decision-making is also critical. So I just wanted to say that in that sense, the youth, uh, children and youth major group, they were highly organized. Uh, they con uh, conducted a number of regional consultations around the world. And, but based on the principle of self-organization, it's really up to each major group to organize itself. And there are many opportunities um, for uh, youth to become involved in that process. Um, and at the same time, I think you can see that the youth are trying to do an awful lot, try to cover a lot of bases, and they are, um, you know, they're succeeding to, to a great uh, extent. So I, I don't believe that, um, that the youth are, if, if you would compare them to other major groups, I don't think that they're any uh, less involved. And I think that in, in many cases, they are more involved. Stephen, thank you very much. We've got time for one more question. Uh, and that is a 
you talk about uh, abiding norms for corporate accountability, but uh, it was said that Stockholm wouldn't initiate any binding decision or negotiation. Uh, Stephen, do you want to make some say something about that? Yes, and I, I, I'm really I'm kind of thinking not just about uh, the Stockholm Plus 50 conference itself. I, th I think that um, it's high time that we, that the world, the international community faces up to this, uh, to this challenge, uh, being one of the major shortcomings of the international process up to now. I mean, why have we've developed, you know, we've just launched a, a, a negotiate, negotiation on a treaty on plastics that's important. Um, you know, we could also potentially cover a wide range of topics where corporate behavior plays a role if we had better binding norms uh, for corporate accountability um, globally. And if if we so if we want to you know if we want to cover a range of problems, that would be a very very big step forward. It's true as far as I know, and I think others have said that there's not a lot of ambition for the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. However, it is an important event. It's a, it's a watershed. It's, um, it's, an, it's an important anniversary. And it's a, it's a place to keep up the pressure. So whether it would happen as an outcome document or whether, it, whether there can be a bunch of very important statement in the beginning of some momentum, that's another question. I think uh, you know, there are different possibilities how this would work out, but I would encourage everyone who's interested in this to try to push you know, in any way that they can for this to be, to come out in some way or another from this conference. Stephen, thank you very much. Uh, it's time for us to move on to our next session, but before we do, I just would like to point out that there's been another hand raised. Uh, so I'll repeat uh, to our audience that we're not inviting uh, attendees to join in uh, either with audio or video at this time, but we will endeavor to do a bit of that in the final session. So Stephen, I wanna thank you so much uh, for your responses and to uh, Elida and Jan Gustav as well. If you'd be so kind, Stephen and Jan Gustav, to quiet your cameras and microphones, we'll uh, now invite uh, Elida to uh, become our next speaker. Uh, and Elida, you have the floor. Yes. Hello and welcome all of you. Um, well, my, my uh, presentation is about the role of civil society and other stakeholders in environmental governance and law. Uh, as I already uh, said, uh, civil society organizations, and when I say civil society organization, by the way, uh, I um, refer to all the non-state actors, stakeholders, etc. So including um, indigenous people, um, local authorities, I know it's not civil society, um, and trade unions, etc. So it's just to make myself, my life easy, I just talk about civil society, but I really refer to all. Uh, next slide, please. The role of, uh, of them and is, is very big. I mean, I will mention five points, but I think we can easily uh, have more points, but um, yeah, it's, as time is limited, I have to uh, limit myself as well. It's about collecting, disseminating, and, and, and analyzing uh, information. It's about uh, agenda setting. It's about supporting and helping and asking for implementation. It's about um, assessing the environmental conditions and monitoring the compliance. Uh, and it's also advocating environmental uh, justice. Uh, next slide. About collecting and disseminating uh, information, um, of course, a CSO have they have more direct relationship with the field. They know what's going on. Uh, they have their daily work with citizens and victims, and they also have a better knowledge of uh, local good or national good practices. Um, they are also very helpful in uh, collecting citizen knowledge. Uh, if you see the, uh, the picture that I used, uh, it is uh, in English, it, it would say um, curious gnosis, uh, but in Dutch, it sounds better. It's curious news. And a lot of people in, uh, in my city where I live in Antwerp, we have this on our windows and that also contains an, a little thing that can measure the uh, air pollution. Um, because of this, this we could uh, really monitor uh, the air pollution in whole city. We could see where the hotspots were, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, that helps uh, the the city council to uh, solve the problems where they were uh, most. 
used. But may, this is just one example, but you have many of those. Uh, it is, of course, also important uh, that we're also networking. Uh, a lot of uh, NGOs, they have their connections with uh, trade unions that are going over their own, their own uh, silos. So you're, they're working together with uh, environmental organizations, development organizations, women's organizations, etc. So they're often more um, able to, uh, to look at things and problems in a more holistic uh, way. Uh, and one of the important things, of course, also is that they translate all those local needs into national policy proposals. And next slide. Um, I think we can say, um, I think I can say it without any doubt that without civil society organizations, there would be hardly any change made. Um, those are the ones that often are coming with very innovative and creative ideas, um, concepts, uh, etc. Like ecological debt. I mean, the whole awareness that uh, that uh, the global uh, north is uh, living on the accounts of the global south, which is the ecological and social debt. I mean, that's a way of looking at the world that really helps also uh, a lot in, in policy making. We have now terms like climate justice, also part of the official language that was not before. Um, a lot of environmental lawyers are also working on definitions on the right for nature. We have the initiatives on ecocide, etc. So you have a lot of, of, of new concepts, new ideas of working, um, that are really a very agenda setting uh, for, uh, the, the, for the decision-making uh, processes. Next one. On the implementation, um, without doubt, I can, we can also say that uh, civil society organizations uh, on the local and the national levels are also the ones that are implementing the international agreements. Um, I don't say that governments don't have a role there. Of course they have, uh, they, they can facilitate, they can uh, put regulation, they can put, uh, they can use uh, all kinds of uh, financial um, instruments, et cetera, et cetera. But um, on the ground, there is a lot of things are happening as well, which is uh, often done by uh, civil society organizations. On the climate actions, you see energy cooperation Initiatives. You see initi initiatives like car sharing, uh, circular economy, repair cafes, etc. Biodiversity. Uh, you have the ecosystem restoration camps. I mean, there are many, many, many of initiatives that are really on the on the side of the implementation of the international agreements. So it's really putting theory and uh, and promises into practice. Next one. Another um, task uh, that uh, the CSO are doing with a lot of su success is the assessing of the uh, of the monitoring uh, and if they are also um, assessing of the monitor of the compliance. Sorry, with um, with shadow reporting, um, we see it a lot. Uh, you have many many reports that give us information that is not given by. Uh, by the scientists or by governments, uh, which is really a kind of overview of what is happening um, in the in the field. Um, daily advocacy policy briefs uh, are written uh, by uh, NGOs or trade unions or whoever, but also campaigning, uh, awareness raising. Uh, it's also increasing political ownership of, of certain uh, topics or certain uh, good proposals, which is, uh, is very important and the government uh, could not do without that because you need awareness raising on the, on the local and, and the national levels. Uh, so that uh, governments feel the ownership from uh, the, the, the citizens to, to do things. Um, if nothing happens, uh, you see also in your in your country, you also you see also an increasing amount of court cases. So in, in Holland, uh, we had the, 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 the case on climate, uh, so that um, with lawyers, uh, they could, I mean, successfully, they could uh, bring the government and also Shell to court uh, because they, uh, they, or they were not very well in corporate accountability, which is in Nigeria, but also that they did not have the, enough uh, policies to really um, reach the, 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 par the, the Paris uh, target. Next one. 
What is also done by uh, civil society organizations and very helpful, of course, on the global level also is linking the environmental challenges with social justice. Um, often when you talk about environment day, uh, it's often about very technical solutions. It's about solar panels, it's about uh, windmills, it's about uh, a lot of things, but it is very important that we also put it more into a political context. So it is important and it's also what NGOs are doing is uh, uh, transforming the technical discussions uh, into political discussions as well. In the end, uh, a lot of our environmental problems, a lot of our social problems and challenges are political and it's not a technical discussion. And for that, you need uh, organizations, civil society organizations uh, that are also able to really have a political discourse and make an analysis that is also based on, on power relations and on, uh, on, um, on justice issues. Next one. Um, as it was already uh, said, um, good environmental governance is key. Um, it is important that the institutionalization of civil society participation through the whole decision-making circle is there. So what we see more and more, and not only in countries where they don't like civil society, but also in Europe, you see more and more that um, the so-called participation is limited to consultation afterwards. Um, we have in, in Europe, you can have your, uh, your daily work, but filling in all kinds of consultations uh, for the European Commission. Um, you can really fill your day or your whole week uh, with that. But in the end, you don't see any effect of your participation in this one. So that's why I think it is very important that we have, uh, as we call it, um, the, the, uh, the representation of the citizens, which is often done by NGOs or trade unions or local authorities or um, the women's groups, etc. And that those professional groups, so not citizen by citizens, but that those um, um, professional groups are representing big parts of the civil society and those should be on the table in in uh, in all in, in the whole circle of the decision making uh, which indeed starts from um, gathering the facts the brainstorm the pros and the cons deciding the follow-up and also uh, the, the definitions and clarifying but also the implementation I think that's very important that also uh, governments facilitate and finance those civil society groups. So it is, you can see that this maybe is a contradiction, but I don't think it is, that a government is financing his own opposition, but don't see NGOs as the opposition. It's really, it's the civil society and you can't see them as your opposition because they are the ones that are voting for you, I mean, as, as a government uh, representative. So I think it's really part of good governance, of good uh, uh, democratic uh, behavior that civil society groups in the countries are uh, financed and facilitated by the government to do their own thing, of course, and to be independent, but at least to, uh, to be the voice of the citizens in their country. Next one. It was already um, mentioned several times, uh, the principle 10, it's indeed a uh, very important principle, uh, the access to information, participation, access to justice. Um, but I think it's one of, uh, even if it's, and, and it of course is a very good principle, but it's also very surprising that not a lot of NGOs are aware of this one. It's an instrument that you can use, but a lot of NGOs are not using it because they don't know the existence. Of course, it's only in the, in the, um, in the countries where uh, they signed uh, the Aarhus Convention that it is also uh, legally binding now in, in the ESCASO agreement as well. But the principle 10 is there for all the countries. You, all the principles in the Rio uh, Declaration are there for all the countries. So you can also use them. Um, so I give this as an example of there is a good instrument, you can use it, but civil society organizations are not using it, or at least not enough. And you have many of this kind of, of, of examples where I think that civil society should focus more on governance issues. As I said also, in, uh, as an answer in one of the questions, I think that civil society organizations, we are focusing quite a lot on topics. We know everything about climate change, and we also know what to do to achieve a better climate. We know everything about biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. But 
the weak point is there. I mean, you can define your targets, you can define your uh, your goals, but if it's not implemented, it will always just remain a piece of paper. And that's why I th why I think that the role of civil society organizations could be much much stronger there, and we could use uh, much more our power to 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 implement the international agreements also to the national levels. Next slide. That's why I think that we should be the bridge from the international agreements to the local actions. CSO, we are the ones that know about the international agreements and we are, as I said, very close to the local actions. And there, we, we should have that, that, that bridge so that the, the paper that is produced in Nairobi or in New York or in Geneva or wherever there is a headquarter of the UN or in Brussels, if you talk about the European Union or in, in Addis Ababa when you talk about the African Union, um, it's this, this kind of agreements, this kind of promises we really have to bring home to the national and the local, uh, local levels. So implementing good environmental governance structures and building institutions is still too weak. And it's partly, let's say, we can blame the governments for that because they are the ones that should build institutions for environmental um, topics as well. But as civil society, we can also ask for it. Um, also, I think in the enforcing environmental law, we also need more CSO involvement because, as I said, we are often the ones that do have the knowledge, but we are not using that knowledge for the real implementation at, um, at, in the field. Next one. So I already uh, wrote down some recommendations. Um, also uh, based on uh, our former um, presentations uh, towards UNEP. I think uh, it, isn't in, it is important that there is more coordination and facilitation to implement and enforce environmental governance and law. Uh, for that, uh, we need a framework uh, with um, concrete goals, with concrete targets, with means of implementations. And means of implementation, implementation is not only um, uh, fi financial means, it's also uh, knowledge about environmental law and governments. Uh, it's review mechanisms, which is very, very important because without um, review mechanisms, uh, we can just uh, promise everything on the international level and not do anything on the local level. So we need to have a kind of review monitoring of the progress on the national levels. And of course, for that also you need uh, indicators. What I think is very important to watch UNEP is that they take more, much more political leadership. As I said, environmental um, um, challenges, social channel challenges are not just there uh, because of they are there. It's really often men, women, but mostly men made. So it's also something that we can solve um, by men, by women. And for that, you need political leadership. Uh, towards the nations and the regions, uh, it is, as I uh, said, facilitate and support civil society organizations, implement good governance. Also, very important, maintain ministers for environment. What you see happening on the global level is that we have less and less ministers for environment because they are getting away streams um, in ministers of um, climate. Um, ministers of uh, infrastructure, ministers of natural resources, ministries of forestry. But of course, it has all links with the environment, but you need a minister for environment that is a protagonist of all the environmental topics and not only climate change or not only um, one of the other things I just uh, mentioned. Having a minister for environment also will, uh, will help, of course, to have a better institutionalization of environmental uh, topics and environmental governance topics and also participation from civil society organizations. Um, they need to implement international agreements. Um, a lot of nations, uh, they signed once an MEA and multilateral uh, environmental agreement, but uh, years after years after years and the change of ministers and even the, the kind of uh, abolishing the, the ministers, uh, they forgot that they signed an international uh, agreement, an MEA, and then it's also, of course, not implemented. What is also important is that also on the national levels, you have legal frameworks to enforce corporate accountability. 
Um, towards the civil society organizations, uh, I would mention as recommendations that um, we also advocate on governance and environmental law issues. And that's, as I said, to make the bridge between the international and the national levels. I think that was it. Thank you. Laura, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think what we'll now do is open the floor. Well, I should say uh, we'll again review the uh, questions that have come in. Uh, Stephen and Jan Gustav, if you can activate your cameras and microphones, should you wish to uh, jump in. Uh, we have a, uh, let's see, we got a few questions here. Uh, let's start with, um, we have um, one question is, could you initiate a document that we could support and could someone who was accredited uh, then make a strong statement in the plenary? Mm. Who would like to take on that? Um, I don't know if you if you talk here about a statement in the plenary of, um, of the Stockholm. I mean, there are several ways of participating. You have the leadership dialogues, you have the regional meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is still not, um, we, we still don't know who is going to speak uh, for uh, the major groups because we have an existing structure for major groups and other stakeholders, which are the nine major groups. They are all self-organized. Um, you can find the addresses on the on the on the UNEP website, you have other ones in, in New York. So those are the ones that are now officially uh, organizing um, the uh, the input from the major groups into the uh, into the uh, Stockholm uh, meeting. Um, but of course, it's always good to have a strong statements. And we had many meetings, international meetings with very strong statements, but that's not really going to change the world. I think, and of course, it's a sign. It's good that, that there are these kind of statements, but I think the work should be done afterwards. I mean, already now, of course, I mean, already 20 years ago. I mean, but that's the work that we need to do on the, on the ground. I could add um, something that, uh, you know, in, in UNIA uh, 5, 5.2, um, and also in the, um, the special session on UNEP at 50, uh, there were joint statements which were made by the major groups and stakeholders. They are out there. Um, you know, they can be picked up. They can be... Um, you know, they can be presented again, or people can be reminded about them. But I agree totally with Lida that it's, you know, the statements are one thing, but act action is the other. I think the statements can reinforce the action, they can help the action. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, as you know, there's, there's not a clear, um, I, I mean, I'm one of the representatives of the science and technology major group. And I have to say, I don't still, I still do not have a clear idea of what is you know opportunities there are going to be to really make a strong statement within this process on behalf of the major groups and stakeholders i expect there will be but uh, it's still a little bit early for that thank you stephen um let's see we have some other questions um what are some of the ways you believe civil society organizations can be more effectively institutionalized throughout decision-making processes at international, national, and corporate levels? Who would like to take that one on? I think you you, you can ask. I mean, uh, I think uh, if, if, of course, depending on your, the country where you live, of course, but uh, I think it is uh, one of the principles of good governance that civil society organizations are part of the decision-making uh, process. So I think one of the things, and that's what I, 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 uh, what I said also, is that you can also really ask for this kind of thing. So instead of only focusing on the topics, and of course you have to do that, I'm not going to say that not, but also focus on this kind of governance issues, which are often also a problem in, in, in any country. So I think civil society, and not only in the environmental organization, Organizations, of course, I mean, all the civil society organizations should be in a network on the national levels and really ask for good governance and having participation opportunities in, the, in, the, in their countries. It is, I think, also quite clear that uh, in countries where you have a strong civil society representation and uh, you also have less corruption because you have more eyes looking at you on what you are doing as, as a government uh, official. So I think that is also very important that it's not only working on the ground as an NGO, but also really doing the, um, the accountability, which is the governance issue on the national levels. 
Can I also just add, add to that a little bit, uh, um, Charles, because uh, I, I very much support what Lida is saying, but also what Lida and Stephen and I have pointed to is that uh, not only numbers matter, but facts matter. And what you say is extremely important. I mean, we, we've seen so many times that civil society people come completely unprepared to meetings. And uh, I'm sorry to say that sometimes talk nonsense. Uh, if you come with a, uh, an input which based on facts and you have really a representative background so that you have consulted with your constituency, you will be listened to because relevance is extremely important in all the elements of governance we, we, we speak about. So, you know, facts as well as relevance of these facts to the context we are addressing. It's extremely important. Thank you. I would just say internationally, <clears throat> join a, join one of the major groups and become active in the major groups. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly on the international level. I think on the national levels, I think it's, it's it, then you have to be uh, organized on the national level. Um, but yeah, indeed. And and, and there's one more thing. I mean, we talk about how, how do we implement this? And, and lots of these UN conferences come out with action plans. For instance, UNEP, which we talk about, agree on, on program of actions, and they have something called the medium term strategy, which outlines uh, very concrete uh, uh, elements to be implemented over a four year period. And unfortunately, again, this is what we all see that uh, we are very uh, engaged in, in plenary discussions, and then we forget to implement what we agreed to when we come home. So implementing what's already there is a, is, is, is a way to, to really improve on the environmental issues as well. So, you know, implement what's already there is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see now, we have, um, that is it on the questions. And we are now coming up, uh, it's time for the final uh, segment uh, of the webinar, which is uh, the closing discussion uh, to be moderated uh, by Lida. Um, Lida, we, um, what I would say is we, uh, in order to do so, in order to bring in uh, others, as you are aware, if you uh, go into the participants uh, section, uh, you can yeah. give uh, participants access, your know, permission to speak, so to speak, uh, and you know, bring them in and out as uh, the case. So is it your intention to ask for, um, you want to start this off, but ask our uh, participants to raise their hand if they want to engage and join yeah. us? Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, just for uh, our having our own structure. So um, I already wrote down some recommendations uh, and then on the three levels, which one is towards UNEP which is what do we expect from UNEP to do? One is towards nations, regions, and one is towards uh, ourselves, which I think is also important. If you want to strengthen environmental governance a lot, we also need to, uh, to be active, and I think even more active in, in this one uh, as well. So uh, yes, let's have a few minutes on what we would ask uh, UNEP uh, to do. So if someone wants to... Um, to come up with a recommendation. And I really would like to ask the people to just, I mean, to really focus on recommendation and not all kind of other questions because that will mix, mix it up, I think, too much. Um, so someone wants to, to get in and then we can indeed give the person uh, the floor, but only if they promise to come up with recommendations towards UNEP on this month. You can raise your hands under, so you have the, the Q&A below. Yeah, there, is, there is one. I'm going to uh, allow this person to talk. Uh, there okay. We go. Okay, so it's Severin. You can talk. Uh, thanks so much uh, uh, for organizing this uh, meeting. Uh, I am indigenous people uh, and also a global coordination uh, and indigenous, indigenous people platform for indigenous people global forum for sustainable development. Uh, my concern is about uh, indigenous people, how uh, could be involved in the implementation of outcomes of uh, uh, Stockholm plus 50. Because uh, sometimes uh, we are uh, left behind uh, 
because of food, there is no policies. There is no mechanism how indigenous people could be involved in the different uh, outcomes from the high decision, uh, such as the UNEP uh, session, uh, UN session, uh, about the uh, climate change, about the mm-hmm. sustainable development goals. Uh, yeah, that okay. Is no, I think, very, very, okay, okay. That I is think you, ma- you made your point. Um, I mean, it's, it was not what I asked for, <laughs> which was recommendations to put UNEP. But I think what is what you said is about the role of indigenous people. I mean, we, we do have a major group for indigenous people. Uh, so there is an open channel for indigenous people to, uh, to uh, participate in all UN meetings, especially also in UNEP in New York. So I mean, they're very open for indigenous people and also now in the, in the Stockholm meeting. So I think maybe there you should uh, find the right person persons uh, to connect with um, and uh, and be active and participate uh, with them because the indigenous people major group is indeed not very uh, full with, with with people so maybe it's not known under the networks of uh, indigenous uh, peoples uh, Richard some do you want to speak so you we can you allow you to talk yes you have the floor okay. I want to say uh, hello to all and uh, thanks to the organizer for organizing this uh, webinar. And I think one of our one of the recommendations could be uh, I didn't see the aspect of sustainability highlighted in many of the presentations, uh, which is very important uh, because mm-hmm. uh, most of these agreements uh, uh, and sometimes the outcomes of the agreement and or the action plans requires uh, a sustainability aspect, financial sustainability, even relating to civil society, uh, relating to capacity building. These are things actually need to be, you know, uh, uh, highlighted and implemented. I think that could be one of the recommendations, look at the different aspects of sustainability and, you know, at the end of the conference, it's very important for civil society and all stakeholders. Okay, so I know to down, uh, capacity building is a very important, but also financial sustainability. Okay, so maybe uh, we can also open the floor for people who want to make comments on the recommendations for uh, to, towards the nations, through the countries or the regions, or also for the civil society organizations. Someone wants to take the floor or put something in the chat. So if you don't want to speak, you can also put something in the in the chat. Please, if you do, would like to speak, raise your hand and we'll invite you in. No need to be shy. Please feel free to jump in. We welcome everyone. I see a, a comment in the in the chat from uh, Lori, where she uh, proposes that uh, maybe CSOs can evaluate if and how indigenous people can participate in Stockholm Plus Fifty and uh, and help them there. I think that's indeed a good idea. I mean, if there if you if you have knowledge of indigenous peoples, networks of indigenous peoples, and they are not aware of uh, of their channels, how to participate in this process, then of course it's very helpful if you can uh, show them the way. But in, in, in that context, just quickly, I, I know the Indigenous Peoples uh, Association of Sweden has uh, uh, been given the privilege of having a room and and a site inside the official uh, the official meeting room. So they should contact the Indigenous Peoples Association in Sweden for for getting in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, Elizabeth Ann, you had an Ann Mark Haver wants to speak. So yeah, and then I, Elizabeth, I would also invite you to raise your hand because. Um, you have a lot to say in the chat, so maybe you just want to say that uh, yourself. But uh, Mark, uh, please, you can talk. Hello, thank you so much for answering my questions. Um, I thought this has been a really fruitful discussion. One um, part of the background of Stockholm Plus 50 that we heard at the beginning of the webinar 
was recognizing the way in which that the human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment was not necessarily an agreed upon outcome of the original Stockholm Conference. I was wondering now that the UN Human Rights Council has adopted that resolution that establishes that a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is a human right, how we can institutionalize that and include that in civil society advocacy for governance and environmental law issues on national levels. What does that look like? What are the major aspects of this human right that we can work to have uh, nations propose policies on and work on? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's it's absolutely necessary that we uh, that we focus on that as well. Uh, I think not only for Stockholm, I think it's also very important to do that at the Human Rights Council, to be very honest, because um, there um, I was quite involved in the UPRs, which is uh, the periodic, periodic reviews uh, for the human rights to see if countries are uh, violating or not the human rights. And it's very important that we also integrate there the environmental rights in, 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 that, in those reporting as well. But of course, the other way around is also very important that UNEP is also taking that more seriously and see that as, as um, I mean, in their midterm strategy are, are also having plans on how to implement indeed the human right for a safe and healthy environment. But maybe Stephen wants to uh, add on this as well because he's the lawyer under us. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, it's a great, it's a really great question. It's, it's, uh, I, I want to bring attention to the fact that, um, so David Boyd, who's now the special rapporteur on human rights, the environment, uh, many years ago, maybe seven or eight years ago, I think, um, you know, had done a complete survey of all the um, expressions of a right to a healthy environment in, in national constitutions, also sometimes in sub-regional, sub-national regional laws, like state laws or federation federal um, uh, state laws. And um, it, it is quite widespread, but what, is, what we haven't seen is we haven't seen a clear international global statement uh, that this is an agreed norm globally. And even what you see coming out of the, the Human Rights Council is not that because it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a subset of the international community. It wasn't unanimous. It gets then you know, referred to the um, General Assembly. The, its fate there is unclear. Um, Stockholm, I think, and, and Stockholm has its own problems because there were um, a lot of countries that were not represented in Stockholm in 1972. Sometimes it's criticized as having only limited participation from the global south. Um, but it is, I think, still the outstanding uh, statement internationally. Fortunately, it's still standing. Fortunately, there is movement towards the recognition of this right. There's a lot of argument about what it means, what the, what the right means, how you would operationalize it, what, um, what it would mean in terms of trying to enforce it. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a great area. It's a complex area. I, I follow you and I, I would say, you know, I would recommend that this could also be something which should be put on the agenda in a more clear way for the international community to deal with and to come up with some sort of uh, accepted uh, shape or definition to what this right means and how it can be implemented. It's a long process, but it has to start, yeah. Yes. Okay, um, if there is, I see, oh, there is also maybe some question answers in the Q&A box. I'm just looking at it now. There's another uh, hand raised uh, light up. Okay. I'll uh, okay. bring that person in. Okay, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Yes, my name is my name is Brian Lepish. I'm a first year student in Daystate University, and I'm honored to be part and parcel of today's meeting. And my concerns uh, my concerns will be based on towards the nation about the channel of funding. Uh, this is evident even in my own foundation that uh, some funds may come, but some of these dominant organizations that have always helped in environmental mitigation and trying to bring a change. Uh, some of them, they are given funds, but the structure in which they implement these things, you look at the, there is high chances that these people take part of this money and use it for their own gain, not to come deliver that change that is required. I'm from the Maasai land where we have always faced drought and drought and 
low seasons, low, low raining season. And we see that some of these organizations come give peanuts. And when we look at the you, uh, when you look at the UNEP reports about some of these organizations that set their camps in our region, we, we find that these people are embezzling these funds. Now I was requesting mm -hmm. if we could come up with if we could come up with a good structure of transparency and accountability in how they in how they in how you give funds and how they implement those policies. Because I believe when you give funds, the policymaker has has to benefit from this project. In the in the sense that the policymaker mm -hmm. is only benefiting from the paperwork, but on the ground, the the targeted group is still dying is dying out of hunger and these people said that they're able to change uh, i feel that we are trying to we are trying to create we are trying to we are trying to solve a problem by creating mm -hmm. by making people rich instead of making the people at a better place this is evident yeah. i've seen this and i've been feeling bad about it yeah yeah i can now. absolutely understand that that is that that's indeed very bad. I mean, and I think that that's why it's so important that there is that accountability um, for not only the the corporates what they do, but also the decision maker. I mean, the governments what they uh, what they do, and that's why I think it is very important that you have strong civil society organizations that are together indeed able to have that accountability mechanisms towards their own government and their own and their and the corporations in the in the country. But um, I mean, I think it's also important for um, the NGOs themselves. There isn't transparency uh, register as well for international NGOs and NGOs. So if there is something wrong with an NGO, you can also um, you can also let's say uh, complain about it in that if they are registered in that uh, register. Maybe uh, Jan Gustav wants to add on this. No, I, I I completely agree with what you're saying, and and any 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 kind of misuse must be addressed immediately because uh, we know that uh, w the work we are doing or trying to do with all these international organizations and and the systems we're trying to 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 address always suffers from very low funding and uh, and uh, if it's misused the loss of credibility in what we're doing is great so so this is an extremely important uh, issue mm -hmm. and as Absolutely. you said it, it you know corruption doesn't only unfortunately apply to the private sector or governments indeed i see two hands or their old hands no, uh, um, no, they're 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 they are back up again. But be mindful okay. that we are getting close to the end of our okay. session. So, uh, what it's up to you is whether or not we invite them in, or you want to have time for you, young Gustav and Stephen, to have some a minute of closing comments. Yeah, because um, one of the things that we also uh, are um, trying to have in those in those webinars is to come up with some recommendations for the uh, the, the people's narrative, which will be discussed in later in in May. Um, so I don't know if Stephen or Jan Gustav have additions on the recommendations, or if there is an. Um, you can also put it in the chat if you have textual um, additions to the recommendation that you see now on the screen. I only wanted to repeat the, my wish that, about the corporate accountability. I had to reflect that somewhere. It did seem like there was a little bit of support for that in yeah. the comments in the chat. But yeah. I mean, one thing I would, I would really say to people is, I mean, this 50 years is a big deal. So um, uh, Rio plus 20 turned out to be very positive, especially if you would compare it perhaps to some of the previous meetings uh, in, along that and, and I think it was because of the spirit of Rio, of the original Rio in 92. And I, I'm hopeful that the spirit of 72 will somehow carry also into this meeting. So I would really encourage people to just not feel limited by what's being said in terms of the lack of ambition of the international community and make it into what it is that you want it to be. Okay, thanks. Jan Gustav? Well, yeah, I could echo that, but I could also uh, add something. Uh, when, as I was in Stockholm in 1972, we felt that we had accomplished great things at the end. And, and there was a strong feeling of euphoria and that we were on the right path. And uh, in, in some cases, we are repeating ourselves. However, 
Uh, we're not. Uh, there is lots of progress being made between then and now, and that, and that progress must continue. Um, so so uh, we're often met with, a, with, with criticism saying that these are words and we need, uh, we need deeds and we need action, and, and action is happening. One thing that I think is important, and I would like to see as an outcome or maybe a starting point, is that we don't mess up the issues. Sustainable development is very, very important. And the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is an incredibly important uh, contribution to where we want to go in the future. But, but the environmental issues are also separate and different from sustainable development. And I'm, I'm afraid that over the last five years, I've seen a, a dilution of these, these concepts and, and what they entail. And we need very specific scientific basis for both of them. We talk about um, the, the uh, UNEP having the responsibility for the environmental dimension of sustainable development and the SDGs. Well, to that is to be said that we may have two or three of the, of the SDGs relating directly to the environment, but there are much more to the environment than just these three SDGs. So whereas we speak about sustainable development, we need to keep that in mind and then, and that it's extremely important, not only the three dimensions, but there are, if you read the 2030 agenda document, there are actually nine factors to get transformative change. But the environment as such is a different field of expertise and needs that so we don't dilute these issues. And I think we should try to make that point also for the future. And a very specific concrete uh, uh, recommendation that I keep repeating, uh, and I've done that for 30 years, Upgrade unit to a specialized agency. I think that would be something we could fight for. Thank you. Thank you, Gustav. Thank you. Thank uh, Lida, you can have the final word before I uh, do our wrap up. No, I think I've said everything. Um, I think we, we can go on with the recommendations that we, uh, so we will add the ones that uh, Jan Gustav and, uh, and Stephen added. And I think I can, I'm happy with it. And uh, thank you for your participation in this webinar. Up to you, Charles, for the final words. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you, uh, Lida and Jan Gustav, uh, I'd like to say thanks to all of you. And I'll um, also say many thanks to the our guests for joining us today, and especially to the Civil Society Unit at the United Nations Environment Program and the Government of Sweden for their cooperation and support. A big thanks to Lida, Jan Gustav, and Stephen for delivering today's rich and unique content. Now, as mentioned earlier, this webinar has been recorded, and that recording, by way of a link to the uh, Stakeholder Forum YouTube page, will be posted on the Stockholm, uh, pardon me, the Towards Stockholm Plus 50 website within the next 24 hours. And all of the attendees will get a link automatically from the Zoom platform giving you uh, the link to the, uh, to the page where the recording, the presentation, and we'll also save a text document with the information that was in the chat. There's a lot, a lot of very valuable information in the chat in terms of also people's contact details and all that. Um, the last word I'll say is please join us for the remaining uh, webinars. As you'll see uh, on your screen, uh, we have five more, uh, pardon me, six more webinars are scheduled. Um, one of them is yet to be uh, finalized, but we hope to have that finalized very soon. Um, and so do please go on as you did before and register for them if you haven't done so already. And lastly, uh, the next one is on Monday. And before you uh, drop out, the, a short survey will pop up when the webinar uh, is officially ended. Uh, so please do take a few moments to complete it. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you and goodbye. <laughs>